it's hard to say how angry not to be. In 1994, the Congress passed a law restricting the sale of assault rifles to the public. Unfortunately, it was a law that had an automatic 10-year sunset. And in 2004, the NRA managed to persuade George Bush and the seated Congress to allow the ban on assault rifles to be lifted. Since that time, in April of 2007 at Virginia Tech University, 59 people were shot, 32 were killed, 27 wounded. In February of 2009 at a lecture hall in Northern Illinois University in DeKalb, 21 students were shot, 5 fatally, 16 were wounded by a former student at the school. March 10th, 2009 in Alabama, Michael McGlendon shot 16 people, 10 of whom were killed, 6 wounded, during what was apparently a mostly domestic violence rampage in Coffee and Geneva counties in Alabama. April 3rd, 2009, in Binghamton, New York, Kimberly Wong, a Vietnamese immigrant, killed 13, injured 4, who were in a citizenship class, and then he committed suicide. November 5th, 2009, in Fort Hood, Texas, Army psychiatrist Major Nadal Hassan shot 37 people, 13 fatally, wounded 24, at a soldier readiness processing center in Fort Hood, Texas. In January of 2011, in Tucson, Arizona, Jerry Loftner shot Representative Gabrielle Giffords, shot her in the head, and he opened fire outside the grocery store during a meeting with constituents. Six people were killed, wounded 13. Among the dead was a six-year-old girl. In July 20th, in Aurora, Colorado, a gunman suspected to be James Holmes shot 70 people, killing 12, wounded 58. Hundreds of moviegoers had just begun watching the opening of the Batman movie, the Dark Knight Rises. Tonight we will remember each of these most recently murdered innocents by name. And we will hear laments from scripture, poems, songs, and videos. This will take a while, but I think they deserve our time. So we grieve together, we mourn, we may weep, we may gnash our teeth, we may let our hearts race and our fists clinch as we resolve to make progress towards making certain that this never ever happens again. Alex Sullivan, 27. Before heading for the theater, Sullivan tweeted that this would be the best birthday ever. The next big date on his calendar would be Sunday, his first wedding anniversary. Saturday, his widow Cassie was too distraught to speak after a long night with the family searching, hoping to find him alive in the hospital. Marianne Labore, 26, who lived across the alley from the Sullivan's row house, called him the biggest softie ever. Joe Lowenguth, Sullivan's uncle, called his nephew a very, very good young man. He always had a smile, always made you laugh. He had a little bit of comic in him, witty, smart, he was loving, had a big heart. Jessica Gawi, 24. A rising sportscaster and enthusiastic blogger, Gawi narrowly missed a shooting scene where two died at the Eaton Center Mall in Toronto earlier this summer. Gawi blogged about how the experience made her freshly aware of the fragility of life. I was reminded that we don't know when or where our time on Earth will end, when or where we will breathe our last breath, she wrote. Her death at the theater has left the family in complete and utter shock, and her brother, or her brother Gordon, Jordan Gawi, told the KUSA. According to the Daily News, her boyfriend, minor league hockey player Jay Meloff, posted on Twitter, never wanted to fall asleep because it meant missing time with you. And her broadcast colleagues say they lost a future star. Her last happy tweet in all capital letters was, the movie doesn't start for 20 minutes. In a collection of good poems for bad times, we have a reading of uh, 
appointment titled Children's Hospital Emergency Room by Gregory Dunnigan. You do not want to be here. You wish it were you, the doctors, stitching up. It's a cut on the chin, fixable this time, but deep enough to make you think of gashes, puncture wounds, flesh unfolding to the bone. Your child is lying on the table, restrained. You must be still, the nurse who cradles her head is saying, that the doctor is embroidering delicately, patiently, like a kind aunt, but there is not enough solace in that to make you stop thinking of other children whose hurt blooms like a dark interior bruise. In other rooms there is hysteria, the sound of glass shattering, and in the next bay there is a child who is sleeping too soundly. You do not want to hear such silence. The evidence which convicts puts away, wake up, you whisper, wake up. You want to think of water, a surface with no scars. You want the perpetuity of circles, a horizon clear and unbroken, and the sky of flat blue immensity without sides or depth. But there is nothing you can do. When your daughter calls out, it hurts. When things regain their angularity, the vulnerable opaqueness. I'm here, you say. Be still. I'm here. Michaela Medic, 23. Medic called herself on her Facebook page a simple independent girl who's just trying to get her life together while still having fun. According to the New York Daily News, she was a student at the Community College of Aurora and worked at a subway store. Saturday, the street where she lived was blocked by a semicircle of large SUVs and pickup trucks. One man, a friend of the family who declined to give his name, stood in front, turning reporters away. The man struggled to maintain his composure as he said his daughters and the girls in Medic's family had grown up playing together. Moments later, a friend of the family stopped by, hugged, and made small talk in the street. On Friday, Anita Bush, Medic's father's cousin, said the family had waited in agony for the news. Now they were heartbroken. Yet, Bush said, I hope this evil act doesn't shake people's faith in God. Navy Petty Officer John Larimer, 27. Four sailors from the U.S. Fleet Cyber Command, U.S. 10th Fleet at Buckley Air Force Base, went to the Dark Knight Rises. One, Larimer, never came home. A Navy notification team told his family at the next midnight that he never would. I'm incredibly saddened by the loss of Petty Officer John Larimer. He was an outstanding shipmate, said Commander Jeffrey Jakubowski, Larimer's commanding officer, according to the New York Daily News. A valued member of our Navy team, he will be missed by all who knew him. At Crystal Lake South High School in the suburb of Chicago, where Larimer graduated in 2003, English teacher and theater director Ben Stoner told the Daily Herald, he was a unique individual with a really strong idea of right and wrong. Yeah. 
verses 2 and 4 from Isaiah chapter 21. A stern vision is told to me. The betrayer betrays, and the destroyer destroys. Therefore my loins are filled with anguish. Pangs have ceased to be like the pangs of a woman in labor. I am bowed down so that I cannot hear. I am dismayed so that I cannot see. My mind reels. Horror has appalled me. The twilight I long for has been turned for me into trembling. And now from the English poet John Donne, written in 1624. No man is an island entire of itself. Each is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were, or as if a manner of thine own were, or of thy friends. Each man's death diminishes me, for I am involved in mankind. Therefore, sin not to know for who the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. Rebecca Wingo was shot to death in Aurora, Colorado at the age of 32. She was a mother of two and a community college of Aurora student pursuing an associate in arts degree part to the Denver Post. When the gunman burst into the theater throwing gas canisters and an opening fire, Marcus Weaver, sitting in the fifth row, fell to the floor shielding two women, including his friend Wingo. Only two survived. Weaver told TV station WGNT they endured round after round. It was insane. People screaming, bullets flying. I pulled her out, but she was unconscious. I was shot in the arm and had fragments in my shoulder. I'm thankful to be alive. Please pray for Rebecca Lingo and all the wounded. I can't believe this. Her Facebook page says she's originally from Quinlan, Texas, and graduated from W.H. Ward High School in 1997. She also served in the Air Force. The Denver paper said Wingo's father, Steve Hernandez, posted to Facebook. I lost my daughter yesterday to a madman. My grief right now is inconsolable. I hear she died instantly without pain. However, my pain is unbearable. Rest in peace, my baby. Matthew McQuinn, 27. When the shooting began in the movie theater, Matthew McQuinn hurled himself over his girlfriend, Samantha Yowler. She lived shot in the lake. Yowler's grandmother, Elsie Wendell, told the Daily News he did not. McQuinn graduated from Vandalia Butler High School in Vandalia, Ohio in 2004, where he participated in the Occupational World Experience Program. I learned how to hold a job, he wrote in his 2004 senior yearbook. He met Yowler when they both worked at the Springfield Target store. McQuinn and Yowler transferred to work at Denver Target last November. They were at the midnight movie with their brother, with her brother, Nick Yowler. It was Nick who called their mother, Ann Massey, at 3.30 a.m. to tell his family about the shooting. This world, these children are 
so hard to raise God? Why wasn't God watching? Why wasn't God listening? day be darkness. May God above not seek it, or light shine on it. Let gloom and darkness claim it, let clouds settle upon it, let the blackness of the day terrify it. That night let the darkness seize it, let it not rejoice among the days of the year, and let it not come into the number of the months. Yes, let that night be barren, let no joyful cry be heard in it. Let those curse it who curse the sea, those who are skilled to rouse up Levithian, let the stars of its dawn be dark. Let it hope for light, but have none. May it not see the eyelids of the morning. Because it did not shut the door of my mother's womb and hide trouble from my eyes. A year ago when we began reaching out to the world through our YouTube and iTunes channels. One of the first people to reach back to me was Dr. James Wilk, a physician in Denver, Colorado. Uh, we almost daily pass articles, thoughts to one another. He is an avid advocate for the poor and a man of great spirituality and great heart. We were talking after the shooting incident, and I learned of his own heritage as a graduate from Columbine High School and having been a physician in Aurora, Colorado, and so I asked him to be a part of tonight's service. Colorado, I was born here, and I choose to stay here because it's the closest thing to heaven on this planet I know. It's a land of canyons, of mountains, of clear mountain streams, and of wildflowers. 
but I'll bet when you hear Columbine, you don't think of this. I'm James Wilk, and I'm a physician in Denver, Colorado, and I'm a Columbine High School graduate. I attended Columbine High School from 1978 to 1982. On the day of the Columbine High School shooting, I was working in my office seeing some patients when I received a telephone call from my wife who told me that I needed to turn on the news and that some kids were shooting up my old school. I finished up with the patient and went down to the break room where we had lunch, where we had a TV, and I tuned in to see some footage of some kids being evacuated out a window at the high school and heard the initial news reports that there were casualties and that a freshman had been killed out on the lawn. Well, I had responsibilities, I had patients to see, and after watching for about five minutes, I went back upstairs to see my next patient who uh, was waiting for me. But during the course of talking with the patient, I realized that I couldn't actually pay attention to what she said to me because I was thinking about the events at my old school. And when I wrote a prescription wrong because my thoughts were elsewhere, I realized that I didn't have the mental clarity to be a doctor that day and I asked my staff to cancel the patients and to explain to them that I had gone to Columbine High School and I was too upset and that I went home. And I, drive, I drove home that day, I listened to the coverage on the radio, came home to my wife and my son who was in preschool at the time and I pretty much spent the day in front of the television watching the events unfold and later that morning or in the early afternoon we learned the magnitude of the tragedy that 12 students and one teacher Dave Sanders had been killed and several others had been injured and were taken to hospitals. Now there have been shootings since then. There was the Virginia Tech shooting, several other copycat ones, but that was the last one in the Denver area until last Friday when the shooting in Aurora took place. Now I lived in Aurora while I was an intern and a resident and I'd been to that movie theater and when I heard of last Friday's shooting it brought back a flood of memories about Columbine High School and about the the shock and sadness and even anger that I felt after the Columbine shooting and I think that although our, the nation mourns along with us here I think that I mourn extra hard because of my connection to Columbine High School and to Aurora, Colorado. And uh, I just don't have the words to really express myself better. Uh, <clears throat> this is uh, an article written on July 21st, 2012, that appeared in Salon Magazine. It was written by Bill Moyers and Michael Winship. I've edited it down for brevity. The entire article can be found at salon.com. You might think Wayne LaPierre, executive vice president and spokesman of the National Rifle Association, has an almost cosmic sense of timing. In 2007, at the NRA's annual convention in St. Louis, he warned the crowd that today there is now one firearm owner whose freedom is secure. Two days later, a young man opened fire on the campus of Virginia Tech, killing 32 students, staff, and teachers. Just last week, LaPierre showed 
showed up in New York at the United Nations Conference on the Arms Trade Treaty and spoke out against what he called anti-freedom policies that disregard American citizens' right to self-defense. Now, at least 12 are dead in Aurora, Colorado. Gunned down at a showing of the new film, The Dark Knight Rises, a Batman movie filled with make-believe violence. One of the guns the shooter used was an AK-47 type assault weapon that was banned in 1994, and that ban ran out in 2004. Obviously, LaPierre's timing isn't cosmic just coincidental and unfortunate. As Shakespeare famously wrote, the fault is not in our stars, but in ourselves. In other words, people, people with guns. There are some 300 million guns in the United States. One in four adult Americans owns at least one, and most of them are men. According to the British newspaper, The Guardian, over the last 30 years, the number of states with a law that automatically approves licenses to carry concealed weapons has risen from 8 to 38. Every year there are 30,000 gun deaths and 300,000 gun-related assaults in the United States. Firearm violence costs our country as much as $100 billion a year. Toys are regulated with greater care and safety concerns than guns. So why do we always act so surprised? Violence is our alter ego, wired into our Stone Age brains, so intrinsic its toxic eruptions no longer shock, except momentarily, when we hear of a mass shooting like this latest one in Colorado. We have become so gun-loving, so gun-crazy, so blasé about homegrown viol violence that far more Americans have been casualties in domestic gunfire than have died in all the wars combined. In Arizona last year, just days after the Gabby, uh, Gabby Giffords shooting, sales of the weapons used in that slaughter, the 9mm Glock semi-automatic pistol, doubled. We are fooling ourselves, fooling ourselves that the law could even allow an inflamed lunatic to easily acquire murderous weapons and not expect murderous consequences. Fooling ourselves that the Second Amendment guarantee of a well-regulated militia be construed as a God-given right to purchase and own just about any weapon of destruction you like, a license for murder and mayhem. A great fraud has entered our history. With a weak need acquiescence of our politicians, the National Rights Association has turned the Second Amendment of the Constitution into a cruel and deadly hoax.
sun rings out the Memphis sky. Alexander Boick, age 17. Boick was at the movies with his girlfriend, Massimo Cross, when he was killed. His family posted a tribute online. AJ was a wonderful, handsome, and loving young man with a warm and loving heart. He graduated from Great Gateway High School this year, where he had many friends. He enjoyed his friends and family and always brought a smile and quick wit to every occasion. He was a talented young man who enjoyed baseball, making pottery, and music. He was accepted at Rocky Mountain College of Art and Design where he planned on attending classes in the fall. After completing college, his dream was to become an art teacher and to open his own studio. He was dating a beautiful young lady who was with him at the time, and we are blessed that she has survived this incident. We want to try to focus on the beautiful lives that were ended and not the evil that is responsible. This is a time for us to remember our loved ones and to cherish the memories we have with them. Alexander Tevis, 24. According to the New York Daily News, he recently graduated from the University of Denver and was planning to start graduate school for physical therapy. His aunt, Barbara Slavinsky, told the newspaper, he was a wonderful person. He didn't have a mean bone in his body. He was loved by everyone. He was a lot of fun, had a great sense of humor, he was very intelligent. He loved everybody and everybody loved him. And a woman named Caitlin, who wrote on Twitter, Alex Tevis was one of the best men I ever knew. The world isn't as good a place without him. Alex Tevis was an Arizona basketball fan, loved Spider-Man, was an amazing therapist, and died a hero. He could make us all laugh with his Gollum impression. I'll never forget that. Veronica Moser Sullivan, age six. Ashley Moser, who was hospitalized in critical condition with bullets in her abdomen and her throat, could only say one thing on Saturday. Just where was her little girl? Ashley's aunt, Annie Dalton, told the Associated Press that no one could bear to tell her that Veronica was dead. This was a little girl as excited about life as she could be, said the mournful Dalton. The plan for this little girl's summer was swimming lessons set to start on Tuesday. Air Force Staff Sergeant Jesse Childress, 29. An Air Force statement released Saturday said Reserve Staff Sergeant Jesse Childress from Thornton, Colorado, was a cyber systems operator on active duty orders with the 310th Forces Support Squadron, Buckley Air Force Base, Colorado. Three airmen from the base, two women and a man, all in their uniforms, placed flowers at the memorial and straightened the Air Force flag that was already in place and told the proud mourners, we lost a great man. My 
the column that appeared in yesterday's news leader says, every time there is another senseless massacre committed by a madman armed with military-style weapons, there is an article in me that fights to come out. I want to scream at the people who donate to the National Rifle Association, who use lobbyists and campaign dollars to keep politicians on a diamond-encrusted leash doing their bidding, preventing all sane restrictions against the availability of assault rifles and high-round ammunition magazines. Though everyone agrees that the mentally unstable should not be allowed to buy lethal weapons, what more diagnostic criteria is needed other than the desire to own an assault rifle with a hundred round ammunition drum? What else does a person have to do? Serve red wine with fish? But I have written that article more than once. I know the familiar steps of the dance. We have the right to bear arms. Guns don't kill people, people kill people. For those people, the knowledge that a three-month-old baby was shot does not make them question the availability of assault rifles. It makes them ask why a mother had taken a three-month-old baby out to a movie at midnight, as if the mother deserved to have her child shot because of her, her irresponsibility. I sleep with the news on. It's a bad habit, I know, but a habit I'm not inclined to kick. But when I am awakened by a bulletin of this sort, I do not sleep well again for many days. On Thursday, even without much sleep, it still falls to me to join with other volunteers to serve lunch to the ever-growing numbers of Springfield's homeless. The shelter gets hot as the air conditioning cannot keep up as more than 100 people crowd into the small space we have on Commercial Street. And we bring in hot food. The only comfort is the practice of compassion. I cannot make those who would make military firepower available to the public see the insanity of that policy. But I can return to the tasks of putting another ladle full of compassion into the darkness. There is an old Buddhist saying, before enlightenment, I chop wood, I carry water. After enlightenment, I chop wood, I carry water. In a world gone mad, giving ourselves to the basic acts of kindness we are capable of doing may be the only way to hold on to sanity. There will always be members of society who are mentally ill. That is a predictable and unchangeable fact. Often the first time they undeniably display their insanity is after they have murdered several men, women, children, and infants. Then it is too late. I grieve the fact that assault rifles are more available to the insane than mental health care. I grieve the rush to defend weapons that could be controlled, and to blame that uncontrollable but predictable occurrence of a mind that becomes twisted. Other nations have solved this problem. In fact, almost all industrialized nations have done so. Until we rise to that level of moral responsibility, I chop wood, I carry water. You say you see no hope 
You say you see no reason we should dream The world would ever change Saying love is foolish to believe Cause there'll always be some crazy With an army or a knife To wake you from your daydream Put the fear back in your life If someone wrote a play Just to glorify what's stronger than hate Would they not arrange the stage? Look as if the hero came too late Almost in defeat It's looking like the evil side will win On the edge of every sea the moment that the whole thing begins It is love that makes the mortars Love who stacked these stones And it's love who made the stage yeah. Though it feels just like we're alone But in this scene set in shadows The night is here to stay Yes, there's evil cast around us, but it's love that wrote this play. Yes, and in this darkness, love will show the way. And so the scene is set. Feel your own heart beating in your chest This life's not over yet So we get up on our feet and do our best We play against the fear Play against the reasons not to try Play it for the tears Burning in the happy angel's eyes For it's love Makes the mortars love who stack these stones, and it's love who made the stage. Yeah, though it looks like we're alone, but in this scene, setting shadows, the night is here to stay. There is evil cast around us, but it's love that wrote this play. Yes, and in this darkness, love will show the way. Mm -hmm. In this world today, mm -hmm. yeah, show the way. Mm -hmm. In Aurora, Colorado, today, now I'm on Brussels Street today. This world today so mm -hmm. Jonathan Blanc, 26. Jansen Young told the Today Show she survived the shooting after her boyfriend, Jonathan T. Blanc, a Navy veteran and father of two, shielded her from the bullets by lying on top of her. John just took a bullet for me, she said. Blanc always wanted to be a hero. His estranged wife, Chantel Blanc of Reno, Nevada, told NBC News. He always talked about it. They talked about if he were going to die, he wanted to die a hero, Chantel Blanc said. The couple had met at Reno, Reno's Proctor Hug High School in 2004 before he enlisted in the Navy, serving out of San Diego aboard the USS Nimitz. They were married in 2007, and their children are a girl, four, and a boy, age two. He left the service in 2009, and after separating from his wife, moved to Colorado, where he worked at a hardware store.
Gordon Cowan, aged 51, was the oldest person to be killed in the shooting. Neighbors recalled him as a divorced single dad who loved to spend time with his children. He was a family guy, always with his kids, always walking around the neighborhood, said Ismail Botello, 26, who lives next door. Botello said Cowden would walk with his daughter, who'd walk barefoot, and he'd always wave or shout a greeting. Cowden's three daughters and one son in their late teens and early 20s. If we only have love, then tomorrow will dawn, and the days of our years will rise on that wall. We only have love to embrace without fears. We will kiss with our eyes. We will sleep without tears. If we only have love with our arms open wide, then the young and will stand at our side if we only have love love that's falling like rain then the parched desert earth will grow green again if we only have love Two cut on the film who heard it from the 82nd floor. 
choosing between a fireball and to jump holding hands, arm us. I wait beside you, stretch, scratch, taste the air, the incredible joy of coffee in the morning light. Alive, we open eyelids on our pitiful share of time. We bubbles rising and bursting in a boiling pot. During my 32 years in ministry, I've lost six parishioners to gunshot wounds. The first was a husband who killed his wife. The second was a wife who killed her husband. The other four were all suicides. One took 18 months to die after shooting herself in the face. I've personally been held hostage uh, during a, trying to end the domestic violence uh, incident that was held at the end of a shotgun for five hours, um, long Sunday afternoon. I've been under police protection twice when I was fighting uh, bootlegging in Kentucky, uh, beginning my journalism career. The bomb was intercepted at the post office, but others uh, had sworn to kill me. Now, dying while you're doing something right uh, has a certain noble attraction. But about five years ago, uh, we were doing some remodeling in the church I was serving, and the guy we hired as the contractor was subcontracting the work out while he was busy selling methamphetamine out of the Fellowship Hall of the Church. And uh, consequently, was keeping bad records. And, uh, so a guy who felt like he had been cheated both out of the meth sales and payment for work he had done in the remodeling, called one Saturday night and left a message on the recorder at church telling me that he was going to come to church the next morning and kill me while I was preaching. He evidently was high because he called four more times. And so that Sunday morning, the first to arrive, I listened to five messages from a man who described the assault rifle that he was going to use to shoot me while I was preaching. Um, because he didn't get paid for his drug sales, which of the things I would like to die for, that is not on the list. I called the police, of course, and the police said that if he showed up and shot me, to be sure to call them. <laughs> so we posted people at the doors to watch in case someone came in with a gun. Uh, but I, in that church, the pulpit was an elevated pulpit, and I sat behind it and couldn't see congregation until I walked up four steps into the pulpit, 12 feet above the heads of everyone else, where it would have been fairly easy to shoot me, I suppose. Um, preparing for this service, I was looking through Garrison Keillor's book of good poems for bad times, and I found where I had written a poem myself in the back of that. I remember that day I had to preach two services, and every time I stood up and walked up those steps into the pulpit, I stood and stared around the room to see if I saw anyone with a rifle. And when everyone was gone and I wasn't shot, I sat and read that collection of poems for most of the rest of the afternoon. And then I wrote this poem. I didn't die today. No one shot me though I was promised repeatedly that today was the day. No one shot me today, much to the disappointment of ex-wives and other critics. It may happen some other day, without warning, without jumping every time a door opens or a metal chair clangs to the floor. Please, God, let it be for some good thing I've done. Let me lie with Gandhi, on Hoffer and King, not from just some random bullet fired by a lunatic. Let me sleep with the saints, 
and not be forced to surrender my voice to nothingness. We who are still alive have a debt to those who are dead to try to prevent the next incident. We live in a world oftentimes filled with darkness, and so we have met at midnight. And we will leave here tonight taking a bit of light with us as a statement against the darkness. Yeah.